On today's show, I'm excited to talk to Tony Award winning orchestrator and five time Emmy Award winning composer Larry Hockman. We talk about his development as a musician, his approach to composition and orchestration, his work on the Wonder Pets, his award winning work in musical theater, and much, much more. Stay tuned, you're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show, the premier music interview show in the world. We interview the top musicians of the world, including Grammy, Emmy, Tony, Country Music Association, Pulitzer Prize recipients, Fulbright Scholars, and many, many more. I am absolutely delighted to introduce my guest today, Tony Award winning orchestrator and five time Emmy Award winning composer Larry Hockman. As a co orchestrator with Stefan Aramis on the Book of Mormon, Hockman has won the 2011 Tony Award for Best Orchestrations and also the 2011 Drama Desk Award. He has also been a seven time Tony Award nominee for Best Orchestrations for productions such as A Class Act the 2004 revival of Fiddler on the Roof, The Scottsboro Boys, Monty Python's Spamalot, Something Rotten, the 2016 revival of She Loves Me, and the 2017 revival of Hello, Dolly. As a composer, Hawkman has written acclaimed works such as Songs of Freedom, American Dream, co-written with Laurie Hawkman, Shomir Yisrael, In Memoriam, Reason to be Thankful, and Meditation. He has also composed music with Mark Elliott for the original musical Perfect Life, based on the book by Laurie Hockman, directed by Barbara Schuller. He is also orchestrator for numerous solo artists such as Sir Paul McCartney, Audra MacDonald, Hugh Jackman, Brian Stokes Mitchell, Eric Idle, Barry Manilow, and many, many more. Additionally, Hockman has written numerous commercial jingles and provided orchestrations for 18 films. Larry, welcome to the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Can I take you back to when you first started music? You seem to be a very good sight reader. You have perfect pitch, took piano lessons, and you were quite a a formidable pianist. Did you want to be a concert pianist at some point? And can you just describe how long were you taking piano lessons and who were your teachers growing up for with just regarding the piano? I started playing before I can remember in that my, my parents told me, later on that I was playing by ear on the nursery school piano when I was four and they were recommended by friends to to provide lessons for me so I did that when I went into kindergarten I I had my first piano teacher that was Mrs. Batchelor and my second piano teacher was not long after that and he actually I moved back into my hometown and he's I reconnected with Irving Weinberg who is still a good friend of mine uh, locally Uh, and that was you know that's what, 60 years ago. So, um, uh, but then I, I had a uh, piano lessons, uh, through my, uh, through all those years, uh, those years, meaning when I was, uh, from when I was five until, uh, right into, uh, my second year of, well, actually all through, all through my, uh, four years of college at Manhattan school of music, Eastman school of music and Manhattan school of music. Uh, so that's, that's um, my piano lessons. You did ask me who the teachers were, so I want to I want to give a shout out to Vincent Lenti at at Eastman, and uh, Isidore Freeman. My late uh, he um, we lost him just a few years back. He was uh, when I was a senior in high school, as well as Helen Lindsay, who we also lost along the way, and uh, at Manhattan School, um, um, uh, Mr. McLeod. I think it was George McLeod who I. Want to make sure it's not George McFly. That's the character <laughs> in the Back to the Future. Right. George McLeod, rather. So uh, those were all great teachers. Now, were you a, a serious practicer? And how many hours did you practice a day? And was it was it all classical? Did you also delve? You had good ears. Did you play other styles of music growing up? Well, I I loved uh, as soon as the the Beatles came out, I was playing rock and roll as much as I could, and I actually practiced my classical lessons as little as possible to get by. Okay. I got to be a good sight reader, but but I be, because of that, when I when I realized that the people that do that are become concert pianists, because they uh, I learned how many hours a day they practiced. From a very early age, I totally gave up the idea that I could ever be a concert pianist. But happily, because my sight reading got to be very good, uh, and then my interest in theater um, uh, exploded from when uh, uh, in uh, 
friends of mine were into theater, and I I discovered the whole um, the whole theater scene when I was uh, in high school. And um, Stephen Sondheim had just come on the scene then with Company and then Follies. So uh, in my first uh, real job at Summerstock, I got to be even a better sight reader, and I realized that I could I could be pretty much at home in a in a Broadway pit. So at that level, I was very good, but compared to the people, again, as that, uh, I mean, I ain't no Jean-Yves Thibaudet. There are people that play circles around me, and uh, I, I just would not compete on that level. But compared to broken pianists in that day, I was pretty good. Yet, I will confess, there are some mighty good pianists that are now in the Broadway pits that I think are on a, on a higher level of playing than when I played in the pits, which was in the 70s. Now, you have perfect pitch. I'm always curious about people with perfect pitch. Do you have to ever train your ear, like with relative pitch? Did you have to study how chords move, or do you just hear it and you know the root motion moves from here to here? Well, that's a great question. I, I actually had great ear training classes through my theory teacher, Ron Ackley, and, uh, and at uh, uh, early on, uh, but because I had theory at such an early age, I actually placed out of the theory courses once I was in college. So the answer is that perfect pitch is, is good for a starter, but certainly studying harmony and four-part harmony and chromatic harmony and really hearing the guts of a piece takes a lot of, a lot of training and, and learning how to score read. Um, boy, I've never been asked that, but that's a Fantastic question. <laughs> but I'll throw in something very funny that I heard. Uh, I was uh, the first. I was a freshman at Eastman School of Music, and there were very talented composers in the in the uh, freshman class as well as the other classes. And I, it was the first time I was at a composers forum, and I got to hear a piece that I had recently just. I had just written it at the end of high school, so that got played, and I heard a bunch of other pieces, as well as a couple of faculty pieces. Okay, so what I'm getting to is that. A, a composition teacher, or, oh, I should say a renowned composer who was one of the teachers, it was uh, uh, Warren Benson, and this is Rochester, and a, there was a Q&A afterwards, and someone asked Warren, some, some kid, you know, who had a great ear and, and was already composing um, serial music, 12-tone music, and he asked him about the row, and he asked him, is it an inversion? And he asked him all these, and he asked him a very complex question. <laughs> and Warren Benson just said, he said, as a former percussionist, I've always felt that pitch is overrated. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's hilarious. You strike me as someone who's very driven to understand and driven to, to see the history of things and how they're placed and, and how things are done by the masters. Did you um, have that fire at an early age? I actually more enjoy analyzing what someone else has done than having to think up ideas, which I find torturous. But that's where the that's where the the uh, you know the important jobs are. So I have to do the work. But uh, I, you're you're absolutely right. I, I do I I love the puzzle and the uh, the uh, the analysis of it. But uh, what I, I wanted to add on to the previous, you, you actually stumbled upon something, which is, though I have perfect pitch, I will say that the more important, vastly more important, is to hear relative pitch. Uh, you know, it, it's the relation, it's the chords, it's the harmonic structure, whether you have an absolute uh, certain place to start in your head without a starting pitch is, I think, much less important. On the other hand, I've only tried it this way, so I don't know how it would be without. And did you always have it, or is it something... Uh, people have claimed that you can train it. I've never met anyone who's learned it, but you've always had it from childhood? Well, I don't know anyone that says... That. I always had it. In fact, the, uh, my friend reminds me that I once told him, when he asked me, what's it like to have perfect pitch? I said, what's it like to not have perfect pitch? <laughs> but, uh, I mean, as far as I can remember, I mean, I, I've always been able to... I mean, my teachers always remembered that I had perfect pitch before I can remember. So, um, um, and I don't know anyone that that really has learned it, although certainly... Neither have I, and I've been searching. Guitarist, yeah. I'm a guitarist, if he's going to start without a starting note to tune the high E string, chances are he's going to be within a half step or a whole step, or I mean, how far could you go? So someone has, had called it a memory 
uh, you know, you just remember what the pitches are. And we all remember from one, you know, from one, a few seconds to the next or a minute to the next or, you know, and I remember it from one day to the next. But I don't know that that's the type of memory. I think it really is on an absolute um, scale. If, in fact, if Diane doesn't mention, doesn't mind, I'm going to mention that that we we have observed that that she has perfect color pitch, and I know that that's an actual thing. She could go in and uh, without without a swatch and and uh, and look at a um, uh, look at forty kinds, forty shades of white to paint a room, and she'll remember exactly what shade to go for. And I swear that even if she weren't uh, in the vicinity, I would have thought of exactly that example. Let me ask you a little bit about your study of the great scores and, and that kind of thing. So you mentioned that you have a massive collection of classical scores and and scores and, rec and a record collection. I spent all my money for years on records. I didn't realize it would be free eventually. <laughs> You mentioned the Walter Piston book of orchestration is influential on you in your in your understanding and taking it to the next level. Let's describe how did you digest that book? Well, uh, it was recommended to me by our choral teacher uh, in uh, in in senior uh, senior high school. Uh, he had that book and he lent it to me. Now I knew that there was a book written by Rimsky Korsakov, which I read later. I now know that there are other really good books that have been recommended, but I can't compare them because I've only read I've only read the Piston, and I will tell it was a fascinating read, and he he breaks down every instrument and and has printed examples from the literature, uh, and you know you're encouraged to to get uh, to listen to those pieces and to look at the examples, and I did just that. Uh, what 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 might be interesting is that. This was while I was in high school, and I started to collect one score after another of pieces that I loved. Uh, the first, the first four scores I bought were, I found them difficult to read, and then I realized that they were some of the most complicated pieces. <laughs> in the I, I, I started off with Zarathustra and 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 the Rite of Spring. And I said, boy, this stuff is really hard. Well, <laughs> compared to that, most other things are easy, with the exception of things like Luciano Barrio and Ives Fourth Symphony. But uh, I did, uh, uh, so I started my collection, but but I was saying that, so an interesting thing is that I had absolutely no intention that I would be doing this as my livelihood. And in fact, the more I thought about it and the more I heard about the the uh, time pressures that an orchestrator is under and, and what sounds they come, come up with, uh, just out of their head. I was absolutely convinced that this was, you know, this is just a hobby of reading scores and never, never dreamed that I would be doing this. I did a couple of small arrangements. I even arranged my own musical, but it never led to me considering myself an orchestrator, not until I was given the task of writing an overture for the a Sigmund a night with Sigmund Romberg, which toured New York State, and that was when I was twenty, maybe maybe twenty two, and I heard it back. You know, I heard the rehearsal and thought, boy, I actually could do this. And uh, then it all changed. You have a massive record collection, and I, I get a sense now. I'm a musician myself, but I think for non musicians, when you use the word listening. I think a musician uses that word a little bit differently than a non-musician. For instance, a non-musician might put on something on Spotify and then do their laundry. But for you as a really professional, top-of-the-top -top musician, what is the definition of listening to you? When you're listening to something, what are you looking out for? Boy, that's interesting. I haven't really... I'm not, In a way, I have thought about it, but I, I never thought about how to answer that as a question. But I, I think here it is. There are... Sometimes I listen, well, when I first hear a piece and um, let's, say I'm, let's say it's on the radio and I've, I've, I've actively wanted to hear a piece as opposed to it just being on the background. Uh, my first, I just go with the gut. I, I want I to kind of make a decision whether I like it or not. And of course that may change when I hear it a second time, but I, I, I just go with where it takes me emotionally and whether I enjoy the ride and I'm listening for, um, I mean, I react to, to color and I react to, to beautiful harmonies in a way more than I do melody. 
But still, I, I get an overall impression of the piece, and I don't mean in any analytical way. I just either like it or I don't. And then the pieces that I'm more fascinated by, then I'll you know want to often I want to you know follow it with the score, and many times the score is not published or not available, and I'll I'll just listen you know uh, again and again. Uh, without you know without looking at anything but now i'm really listening to what are those harmonies what are you know what is uh what the form of a piece is so elusive and and i feel like in my old age now i'm just starting to understand a lot more about form thanks to my reviewing an old text written by my professor douglas green form in tonal music and it's i'm i'm just i'm just i feel like i'm back in in sophomore theory class, <laughs> getting a whole uh, a whole underground view again, and it's it's making a lot more sense. But uh, as I say, so first I get uh, I my reaction is on a gut level, m um, an emotional level, and then uh, it's it's certainly on the second and third times that I'm I'm really listening for the for those details. You've listened to so much and you've analyzed so much. Does it get faster and faster for you? So, like, for instance, you've looked at Ravel, Wagner, Strauss, Debussy. When you've looked at one, does that really amplify your speed at looking at others? Do you feel like you can really break down a new score that you look at very quickly? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's much different. I mean, now I can... Uh, I remember the first time I decided I was going to really look note for note and read every note of a piece that I knew, which was the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. I remember my driving up with my brother to a, on a ski trip and I was, I was reading, I mean, I would look at every note on every page and, 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 and try to find the, the logic of every note. I, you know, in my head, I was explaining to myself why it was there and, 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 and it does all add up. I mean, Tchaikovsky is just so sound. I mean, every note really does have its place. Uh, where was I going with this? So, so that that took a while, and now I could visit the same score and and go through it much quicker, and I see the patterns, and I'm, definitely I'm a much faster reader now. And I also find um, I was talking to some students at one point, and I said before I start to arrange a piece, the very first thing I would do before I even think about what colors or or what these what these solutions of texture are is I want to make sure I understand everything about the piece harmonically, melodically, and the form of it, and and that when I'm let's say I'm you know working on a a, a new song in in a musical, it may only take me ten minutes. I might I might play through it one time or listen to it one time and and then read through it slowly maybe once and feel like i really have that understanding of of the the tonal centers and and where the progressions are and if there's if there's some unusual harmony i'll i'll i'll, I'll slow down and make sure i understand that and then i i start to think about the you know dramatically and make make sure i i feel that i have a connection to what the what's going on character wise and story wise but all of that um these days, maybe because I've run out of time and the deadlines are, <laughs> but all of that might take me, I mean, it could take me an hour, but it could also take me 10 minutes. Um, and then the rest of it is the, the, the toil of, uh, you know, of putting the notes on the page. Everybody likens Ravel to like a Swiss watch. He's very slick. Everything's in the right place. And what is your take on supposedly clunky orchestration like like i'll give you an example um the rimsy korsakov redid night on bald mountain by mazorsky and for a long time people took that as the, the definitive version and then people started to look at mazorsky's original orchestration and they were starting to appreciate his i guess not as slick not as smooth as korsakov but that it had a little bit of a, a little bit of a raw edge how, how do you strike that balance between something that's super slick and something that has a bit of a raw not so refined orchestration well actually you got me very curious because i i know that i've been i happen to know the the mazursky piece very well and i know it only from the rimsky korsakov version i've never heard the uh mazursky's original I, you remind me of something that uh, my orchestration teacher, Nicholas Flagello, said in class one day. He said the, the Mets spent all this money on on recopying this new 
this newly found manuscript of Boris Godunov. And we're talking about the same scenario. They said they've been, he says they've been playing the Rimsky, uh, I guess it's the Rimsky Korskov all these years. And he's, he said, now they they found the, the, the golden treasure. He said, but, but they were wrong. He said, that piece was not secret. They've had it the whole, people have had it the whole time and they just haven't played it because, and this is Nicholas Flagello talking, he says, it just wasn't very good orchestration. <laughs> Getting back to your question, I, um, I'll tell you, when, when I write, sometimes I really go for that bold stroke and, and sometimes the absolute perfect balance of whether there's five violins against three or whether it's five against four isn't as important as getting the broad stroke. But I, I find when, when orchestration is clumsy to a degree where, where one texture is, is so, uh, so busy and in the same register as another, and you start to hear each one less clearly uh, together. That to me is is not the right way to go. And I don't, I don't, you know, it may be it may be uh, bold and aggressive and, and unusual, but if, if there isn't transparency, um, and I think that's the way Piston would put it in his book. Um, and, and you know, it's it sometimes you just need the separation of 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 timbre or register or both. Um, and well, for instance, let's say there are two elements going on. Let's say one's uh, the main theme and the other is a counter. Um, often, and, and this is true in big band music also, often one will be a single melody and the other will be harmonized. And when you start to harmonize both, and there certainly you'd want them in different registers, but, but it works. I mean, I, I like to have a, you know, if something has a thick harmony and there's some other other element going on, I find that the unison um, will work better. So maybe that I think that's along the lines of what we're talking about. You mentioned a big band. Uh, no one's asked you in interviews that I've seen, but are you a fan of jazz in any way? I don't have the ability to do that single line uh, improv. So I've never been in a jazz group. I, I'm not a good improviser. I mean, harmonically, yes, but not not melodically. Uh, I find that there's plenty of jazz that I enjoy, uh, but but when it gets to a point where I'm, where the focus seems to be on the virtuosity and how amazing it is that they're playing the amount of notes but that the overall sound isn't so attractive, I'm not as interested. And and also by nature uh, of of wanting to understand and put together, uh, you know, like a composition, um, that's where. And this is not a value judgment, but but my own my own taste is where I'm controlling what the notes are rather than giving um, a skeleton to which onto which players would improvise and again i'm not there's it's jazz is you know i have the utmost respect and most admiration for the people that can do that but i i just can't uh i i've some success the only successful jazz writing i've done has been where i've taken my time to explore the harmonies and uh my style in that realm has been compared to Bill Evans. And I feel like I, I really understand the higher partials of, of jazz, you know, complex jazz harmonies. But again, that, that improv, uh, that, that, that those, those cats do, <laughs> I, I cannot. Now you said something that I found really interesting. You said your favorite tunes are ballads and you could watch a Broadway show that is all ballads and you'd have a good time. I could. <laughs> I mean, the history of musical theater is so rich and there's so many great shows. What are your favorite ballads? And when you're orchestrating a ballad or even composing a ballad, what are the things that give you goosebumps? Well, when I'm orchestrating a ballad or, or any song, the first thing that happens is, is total panic and, total, <laughs> and the total belief that I have no idea what I'm doing. And then I settle down and start to find some ideas. Um, the... Uh, the the ballads that I that I love some are as simple and sweet as uh, Irving Berlin from Annie Get Your Gun. There's a one of my favorite songs is is um, 
they say that uh, I think I think the title is they say it's wonderful. They say that falling in love is wonderful is what I is what the lyric is. And uh, I got lost in his arms also from that same show and right up through the the Gershwin songs uh, and right up through modern day. There's there are so many ballads that I love. Uh, and when you wish upon a star and uh, over the rainbow. Um, the uh, but other scores that I that I love are. I mean, certainly there, there's fast and energetic music that I that I love, but those are probably less frequent. Something like the score of Sweeney Todd, uh, West Side Story. Uh, those would always be, uh, and Company. Top here, look at that. Sondheim's represented on every one of those. Are slow songs harder to, to write or orchestrate than fast songs? Actually, for me, they are. Sometimes uh, if a song is, is rhythmic-based, meaning like with a pop rhythm, sometimes all you have to do is set the texture and you, and you find a couple of counter lines and, you, and when the vocal has three beats rest, you put in a bop and a boop. I think I'm really oversimplifying that. <laughs> uh, there's really more to it than that. But uh, um, somehow I, get, I actually get more scared of, of writing the more rhythmic songs. And then after I've done it, I realized how, how much easier it is. And the ballads, I'm always always plunging right into and looking forward to and then finding that they're hard um, because well I guess always I want to make sure that the counterpoints aren't just thrown in but the melody is king and every counterpoint in my mind must serve the melody must never get in the way I, I told a student not that I have a lot of students but I, I remember saying this along the way that when you find a you know you're working with with a given melody and you find a great counter line in it it kind of works but a couple of notes aren't really ideal but you think you'll get away with it my advice is just work it a little bit you'll find some other solution that goes perfectly and I I want to make sure that every counterpoint is right um, and and I and that step for me, is before I even think of what instrument it will be. So I'm developing the texture and the overall harmony and making sure that the, that the piece will, will be satisfying uh, and, and, and that every, every element supports the tune and the form. And then the, 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 the next layer would be uh, deciding what colors to use. And of course, in, the, in today's Broadway uh, uh, economy, let's say, uh, the final step might be, okay, now that I know what colors I'd like to use, I only have five instruments, so how am I going to juggle them around <laughs> and, get, and and try to not have to leave out any notes out of necessity? Now, Larry, you've been part of so many fantastic productions. Can I just rattle off a few names and can we just can you just give me a brief kind of thought on, on, on the ones that I mentioned? Just anything that comes to mind, I'm going to ask you, like, what was it like working on a class act, for instance? Oh, oh sure. Class act. Um I, I have I have great memories of that. That was a a wonderful show to work on. Uh, I I didn't know Ed Kleban's music at all, and uh, um, some of it was was good, but a, a few pieces were were exceptional. Uh, Paris through the window, uh, sorry, Paris through a window. I think is the title. Is a beautiful song, as is the final number called Self Portrait. But there was one piece that that I I had a Real, I'm very fond of this. It's it's the song called Better. Uh, uh, da 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 da. You know, uh, b b late is boring. Uh, try on time. I can't remember it offhand because I'm under pressure. But it's a it's a wonderful song, and um, it the the scenario for my task um, on that song, I was. I was working from basic what was what was essentially a reproduction, a graphic reproduction of the sheet music that's on sale, um, and it was melody with very simple accompaniment, and it went around several times as it modulated uh, in in the form of the of the staged piece, and. Uh, I realized, well, this this wasn't developed by a dance arranger, for instance. This wasn't a, a customized accompaniment, but it was the so so. I went with what felt like, well, how you how you would say a generic 
accompaniment. And then I just had this impulse. We got it got to the third time around, and I had already, you know, uh, this is after I had done a pencil. Uh, I marked up as if a sketch. And as I was putting to score paper, I had a whole other idea. And I thought to myself, this is not at all what's on the page, but I'm going to try it because if they don't like it, I'll just I'll just rewrite it and put what's on the page, which would be a repeat of the first two verses. But I uh, again, this is verse three and the accompaniment was the same as verse one and verse two. And instead of instead of a, a kind of two handed uh, comping uh, rhythm, um, I did a, a stop time in in the in the mid and the bass with the chunk with chunk chunk and the right hand was da, 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 and it was an entirely change an entirely different texture and uh, I thought this is going to be really exciting and I'll, I'll put in some uh, I reharmonized uh, more complex so that it was dump da dump da da ba 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 with uh, the not not your uh, expected voice leadings and not expected chords. And in fact, if you were to put on the album of a class act and go to the third chorus, you'd anyone would hear what I'm talking about. And uh, uh, they didn't. No one said anything. I thought to myself, <laughs> and, but this is one of my first shows for Broadway. And I thought this is what it's like when you've when the idea works, because everyone's busy with with worrying about the problems and if they don't say anything that means it was fine and also i i got the feeling that i wasn't there to to try to figure out what they wanted they came to me because they didn't know what it would sound what it should sound like but rather they they trusted that i would find a solution and uh uh again i mean the no one said to me, oh, Larry, that's great, or this is so different, and, and I didn't expect this. Nothing was said at all. But you can you can be sure that if, if it were not uh, pleasing to Todd Ellison, the music director, or Lonnie Price, the director, both of whom are very good friends, or, um, uh, I mean, I say this with the highest regard, um, that, um, you know, if it were wrong, I would have heard about it and would practically write it. What's it like working with uh, Marvin Hamlish? And was that the first time you worked with him or there other times? Oh, you've worked with him quite a bit, right? Well, actually, I worked with him only in the end of his life. And, of course, we didn't know it was the end of He's his life. He's a character, but... though, right, in, in, the, in, in the class act? Yes, it's, he, is, he is in there because it's about Ed Kleban. And, and uh, Ed Kleban was a composer, lyricist. But uh, his history is that he got his success through his lyrics and he uh, not through his own choice, but he be, he was the lyricist for chorus line and not the composer. And uh, so there's there's a good portion of the show that's about chorus line. And yes, Marvin Hamlish, um, it's, it's about him there. Now, I only well, I met Marvin briefly on some gig long, long ago, which doesn't really count. When I uh, I was recommended to him, uh, really the first major project that I did for him was, excuse me, was the uh, the film The Informant with Matt Damon. And uh, out of the blue, I knew that uh, that um, mutual friend who had worked, who had uh, conducted and contracted for him, Michael Keller, uh, called me and and uh, 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 I think he called me to say that he was recommending me to Marvin and. Anyway, I got hired for that. So that I can tell you exactly when that recording session was because it was the day that Barack Obama got elected. So I'll never forget November of 2008. Uh, so it was only between 08 and 2012 when Marvin died that I worked with him. But he used after after the informant sessions, he consistently used me uh on oh four or five other projects, most of which were a one song or a medley, uh, a recording of music uh, music in my mind for his his uh, his uh, autobiographical children's book. Um, but the, the the one of those after the informant, the the one that was a major project was the Nutty Professor, the musical, uh, which in fact he died uh, during previews of that. That was in uh, in Nashville, and it was. I'll tell you, uh, the first 
I was on edge because there was some some wacky experience where I was under the impression that he kind of ditched me on a project, but I didn't know him. So I thought maybe that's just what he does. And and I realized after the fact that it was he was just absent minded and hadn't oh. realized that, <laughs> okay. that there was a promise being made because everything after that from the informant right on was just delightful. And he was absolutely respectful. And I'll tell you, he was so funny. He, <laughs> I, 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 oh, OK. I just remembered, a, a, the, you'll like this. I'm at his <laughs> Park Avenue apartment, um, uh, penthouse, I should say. And it's eight in the morning and his music editor is there showing him the, you know, running the, uh, um, on on the laptop, the uh, the visual. And he's going through this uh, this cue. He's playing it for me at the piano and I'm, I'm taping it on my little MP3 recorder. And he had, he had written a particular theme with a with a wanting a bass sax. Okay, so then we get to a different part of it, and uh, and something that's slightly reminiscent of that is in the left hand, and I didn't know if it was whether that was supposed to be bass sax also. And of course, you want to be sure about something like that. It's not. There's no two ways about it. It's either bass sax or no bass sax. Um, so I said, I just said, Marv, you know, this is. Again, this is very early on. I hardly knew him at all, and um, I'm just I'm just behaving myself like a good boy. And uh, I said, Marvin, on, at the very end there, do you mean for this to be on bass sax? And he looks at me and he says, No bass sax. And he's playing piano and he's inventing a song at the moment, like a Kurt Vile song, because you have to pay tax. To, don't, don't. <laughs> it's amazing. Relax. <laughs> and he and he's. I tell you, it was like <laughs> that's brilliant. It was, that's brilliant. It was right out of the Hollywood movies. It it just, that's amazing. And it was, and and, and Missy <laughs> Cohen was uh, the music editor, and I remember Marvin was doing this with a straight face, and <laughs> C and I were just cracking. Yeah, up. I would it fall was apart if I saw that live. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> and I'm, t- I, I later learned that that that's very common for him to do at his own concerts. That he would. Um, he would come up uh, with stuff on the spot. Yeah. And, and improvise a lyric at the same time, and and he would, you know, take take some I mean, somebody could whistle a theme, and he could play it. Okay, this is uh, Sondheim on the on a on a lazy day, and, and, and <laughs> he said to me, "Oh yeah, you want to imitate?" He was he was tongue in cheek, but he said, "Here, if you want to imitate Sondheim, you always start with a vamp, and then the vocal the the melody has to start in the oddest note in the scale." <laughs> now you are so acclaimed and you you must a lot of young musicians must be very in awe of you but do you did you have heroes that that kind of that you really looked up to in the field of theater like is there do you have like any idols that when you were young and you were growing up did you look up to certain people well Stephen Sondheim would be the one as far as a composer but as far as well let's see at the point that I was interested in orchestration Jonathan Tunick was was top of the list uh and then alongside, why is, why is he? Be, why is he top of the list? Well, and I was about to say, and then there's Ralph Burns and Billy Byers. Okay, but for my tastes and what I what I had the most connection with, um, well, it was in those Sondheim scores of Company and Night Music, especially that I saw what the accompaniment was written, and without rewriting it, he found ways of putting uh, of using color and not not so heavy layered but um and this you mentioned Ravel before in in the way that Ravel would find that that clear color uh, you know instead of using four woodwinds in in unison he'd use the oboe or he'd use you know a solo cello and and then when it comes back the third time, it would be a bass clarinet instead and, and some very subtle changes. And I'll tell you, I, I remember listening to the the Night Music album for the first time. And uh, I mean, the Night Waltz, the, not, the, the, not the Night Waltz too, but yeah, I guess it is the Night Waltz and, and the very beginning of the show uh, was pretty amazing. And then on on the trio where, you know, it's all about the vocals. There's now, later and soon, and there was a a point in in soon and in fact you know what since we're on audio i'm going <laughs> to 
back up to the piano instead of me singing it. I'll just I'll just play what I'm talking about because okay. it's there's one particular moment, and I thought to myself, well, it's kind of a simple device, and, and the melody, the violins were playing with the melody, and then they, with without warning, they leapt up an octave, you know, into the higher range, just like you might have in some operetta or or opera, and it was. It was just thrilling. So, okay, if Jonathan, if, if you're listening, forget what I said. You know? <laughs> no, that was wonderful. I love that you I played know. the piano. Let's have a corned beef sandwich. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, there were there were particular devices that that I thought were were just perfectly suited to the music. And now, Ralph Burns with Funny Girl, I had adm- admiration for entirely other reasons uh, you know the excitement of uh, of the you know the xylophone or strings against against a rhythm um but um yeah so he's a he's a so i say a close second so those were it, those were people you looked up to and you you kind of when, when you were developing yeah and who knew that i'd become a friend of jonathan tunic in fact the first <laughs> the, the second real job i had in maybe the first real job i had in new york uh when i was in my 20s i was the rehearsal pianist for Pacific Overtures. So it was very soon after I, you know, thought of what I thought, you know, the great Jonathan Tudyk. And here I am two years after that, uh, actually, you know, seeing him every day. I want to ask you more about your composing and see if I can flesh out more things, especially now you mentioned you composed eight CDs of original music for I think the Carlin Recorded Library of Music. Yes. Now, that's a lot of music. Now, you mentioned you were emulating film music of, in a sense. So how long did it take for you to write that music? And what was the range of the styles that you covered? Okay, well, the first time they, I got a call from this library, I was recommended by my, my late friend Eugene Sines, another composer who, who had actually had declined to work for them. He, was, he just didn't feel the the urge to write anymore. And this was for what some people call stock music and other people call library music. Um, but for me, it was a great opportunity because I just wrote, I wrote music and I, I didn't, I don't think of it in terms of pigeonholing it into a, a level. It, it sometimes gets put down, but maybe that's why I'm, they've told me that my stock music is more successful than, than the average because it sounds like music. Yep. <laughs> well, I was asked to write uh, this was a, a library based in England, and they wanted the American sound. So I was the American guy for them, and I did an album of sports music and news music, uh, and that was one CD's worth. It was about uh, 20 themes with some cut-down versions, 30-second uh, and 60-second uh, uh, versions for what they would call a jingle length. Uh, it was about five years after that, that they wanted American music. And, and Nick Ferry is my friend, we, and I would talk and fax back and forth lists. And and we realized very quickly that, that to get an array of American sounding music, it's not just five different things. It's not even 10 different things. We came up with a list of 70 different styles. And I oh tried to gosh. create one major theme for each, including a version of uh, a reharmonization of Star Spangled Banner. And, and uh, though that was a small segment, but one would was emulating Copeland. One was writing in the style of Bernstein, uh, like Cool from West Side Story. One was uh, the Copeland piece, one was like Rodeo, uh, and, and on on the list goes. I, I wrote a, a fife and drums piece. That was that was a four CD set. There was so much music, and uh, my my late friend Larry Gates, also a composer, he contributed a few themes as well. Um, it was about two years after that that they they asked me to do a Hollywood CD, and that turned out to be a double a double album. First the the earlier st- the earlier Hollywood, and then the later, uh, more TV Hollywood. Um, when do you work? Actually, it's a strange question, but uh, do you work in the mornings? Are you a late night person? When do you get most of your work done? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> I'll tell you. I used to be the night owl. I would I would do a gig and and have dinner and start working at nine o'clock and work until two in the morning, and that lasted up until I was about oh I was in my late thirties. And at the point that I got married to my wife, Diane, and there were kids in the household. I mean, these were my, my stepkids, Brian and Sarah, and, uh, they were seven years old. And all of a sudden I was on a school schedule. And once, 
I mean, at first, I swear that they thought there was something wrong with me that I slept till 10. This was unheard of. <laughs> Once I adjusted to their schedule, I found myself getting up at six and seven. And now, over the last 25 years, my the time from nine in the morning, well, it used to be seven in the morning and under pressure at the end of a deadline, it could be four in the morning. But um, most often it's it's from eight, nine in the morning until dinner is my best time. And in the evening, I, I might tinker, I might have some ideas, but I, I, I don't do much in the evening. I, Here's a very, very general question for you. What, what is your approach to composition? Ooh, fear, total <laughs> fear, abs, absolute terror would be a better way to describe it, um, especially if I'm composing for someone. If I'm composing for myself, then I find that I when I get an idea, it's usually, it's usually melody first. And that wasn't how it was when I was a composition student in college. But when I, what was your major in college? Well, it was composition. And I studied with my, my composition teacher was Joseph Schwantner, Pulitzer Prize winner, great composer, uh, as well as Benjamin Lees. Uh, But I didn't find my voice there. I was disappointed in my own writing, more and more disappointed. And it was when I started to write songs about three years after college that I found what I would say to you is I, I really found where my voice is. And I and it usually happens when I've shut everything else out of my mind and I'm either singing to myself or accompanying myself on the piano. And it's not when I sit down. It never happens when I am in a room alone with, with, with paper and pencil. Somehow I, I get better ideas when I'm playing or singing. And it's not that I need the piano to write, but that is always the starting point. Because when I orchestrate, I don't use the piano at all. Wow. So wait a second. Well, is that maybe that is that the perfect pitch thing? You can sit down and just kind of hear it in your head and write it down? Well, I think there I think all arrangers do that, though whether perfect pitch or not. I, I know that Jonathan Tunick doesn't have perfect pitch and uh, by his own admission. It's not, I'm not, I wouldn't know otherwise, except that I heard him say that. And he has no problem with sitting uh, without a piano and, and writing. So I'm, in other words, whether, whether your, whether your internal sense of pitch is agreeing with piano uh, with a 440 is not the relevant um, uh, issue. Do you do that to avoid making your music sound like pianistic music? Well, that's one thing, and, and you don't want to be. Uh, uh, I mean, sometimes I work at counterpoints uh, on the piano, and they come out differently because I'm really finding uh, voices that just are. There's something about the melodies that that when I uh, when I'm playing it again, just like in comp- in composing, um, they they end up more more visceral. But the when I'm orchestrating. Um, I found if I just am playing on the piano, it would just sound plain. In fact, it's it's in a way it's the exact opposite of what I'm doing because I'm trying to add color. I also find that if on um, the rare times that someone says, you know, d- d- would you use a synthesizer to to try out the idea as well? Synthesizer just it's if you want to make it sound bad. But if if I if my task if I'm expected to show an audio demo to someone like in a jingle uh then then i have to use the synthesizer but that's uh, that's um, a very sad day when when that happens and in theater there's no time there's there are never demos in theater film still use them but so so it's just it just comes out better if i'm thinking abstractly on on a you know on staff paper now when, when on the wonder pets which you've won five emmys for is that the same kind of thing? Do you do it on pencil and paper? Interesting. Some of the other composers actually worked right on computer and spit out a score as they went along. I never did that. I would I would work at the piano, composing, and I would I would write it down with a pencil as I went along. And uh, only at the very end, when I had when the final step was to present a demo of my recorded voice and a properly uh, a proper MIDI sequence. That's I would then basically do a, a faithful execution of my of my written composition. Um, but I didn't use synthesizer to compose. I did use piano to compose, and I would always be singing, and uh, and that definitely came out better than if I were to to um, away from the piano to write. It's amazing the Wonder Pets, and it's no it's no surprise that it's won so many awards because it's such a novel idea where you have 
such incredible music and you have it built around the music. Usually it's the reverse where the music comes after everything else. Could you describe working on that project and can you talk about the, the workload? How much continuous music do you have to write? 10 minutes and 41 seconds. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, you've asked two questions and, and they're both uh, great questions. The easy question is um, about the schedule. Uh, they spread 40... 15 minute episodes each, which is really 10 minutes and 40 seconds long. Uh, a, a, a year's worth were, uh, there were two episodes back to back on 20 episodes. So there were 40 pieces that were 10 minutes long. Um, and we had a year and a half to do them. Now, when it got to that point uh, of once the pilot was approved, um, indeed there, first of all, we brought in other composers. I wrote the main themes in my original pilot, but, uh, at that point there was a separate orchestrator, a separate programmer. So my duty was just to compose. And I did about, um, in the first season of 40 episodes, I think I did 14 of them. So it wasn't so crazy. Each episode, the deadline was, was tight, but, but I wasn't writing all the time. In fact, spam a lot came in, in between several episodes and that kind of thing. But but I want to get back to your 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 question was so smart as far as the format of the show. You're right that the what was different about that show, and I uh, I know I've said this on on other interviews, but it's so important because um, we kind of broke the rules. I I it might have been my suggestion, but I realized this that the solution to what they wanted, which was in Josh Selig's words, a, a child's idea of an opera, that I thought let's do an entire piece of music which on which the dialogue and action sits so that my demo would be a continuous piece of 10 minutes of music as opposed to uh, other shows where you would only pre-score the the segments where a character would sing and everything else would be done in post in other words a typical show you would do you would record the dialogue as 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 a continuous piece or edit it down to the continuous episode and you'd only stop and do music records for a part where a character would sing and therefore have to be in sync uh, where the music would be driving the rhythm but here the entire episode of 10 minutes and 40 seconds was one continuous piece of music and uh, i just was proud of it because it was in a way it was done backwards of other shows the only thing to compare it to would be something like Fantasia, where you would, where where Disney took the piece of music, and but but that didn't have vocals. So in a way, I don't, I can't think of any comparison. Now, musical theater has, I guess, a lot of influence. I mean, opera. I'm sure it used to be the popular music of the 19th century. Are you very well versed in opera? Like uh, you mentioned that you had all the scores of Wagner. Boy, you really did your research on me. Wow. <laughs> I guess the, the, the duality is symphonist versus operatic form. Are you very familiar with both is what I'm asking. Yeah. Well, I'm not an opera buff and I don't follow the characters and the story. I know some of them and I've read through the libretto uh, and I've seen a few operas. But more often I would have purchased uh, the LPs and listened to the opera as a score. And even though I like hearing the, the voices, I'm as much interested in the in the orchestra uh, symphonically uh one of my favorite operas certainly is Vatsek and with or without vocals uh it's just one of the most amazing pieces ever and um in fact it reminds me of what Eric Korngold said about his about the the first film scores which he and Franz Waxman and Max Steiner they were inventing the art form and I think it was Korngold that said these are operas without words All right <laughs> Because you know, motifs, and yes, I do know the Wagner operas, and I I have all the scores, um, and I'm my fascination is how the orchestra tells the story, and I'm more interested in those operas than the ones that have set pieces with an aria and a chorus, and that doesn't mean that I don't love Carmen, uh, and I love all the Puccini, but but I'm most enthralled when I'm hearing uh, the the score. Tell a story. You mentioned Korngold. Um, I, I was so struck by the fact that King's Row sounds so much like Star Wars. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, actually, are, are you sure you don't mean the theme to Superman? Oh, <laughs> um, both of them, I think. Because it's right out of there. There, and 
with all admire with all due respect for John Williams, he really did kind of borrow that <laughs> that theme there. I read something interesting on the on the record jacket, the record label to King's Row, which was that Korngold wrote the main theme before he knew what the movie was about. He just liked the title, King's Row, <laughs> and it sounds very royal, but I'm told that the movie has nothing to do with that. That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, uh, I also know Korngold's operas, um, Die Totterstadt, and um, I forgot the name of the others. Uh, he's written several, and I have I have a couple of them. I even... I even got an illegal Xerox of the vocal score, which is out of print. Can I ask you, uh, just to end off, some a couple of really quick, fun questions. Who are your top three favorite composers and your top three favorite, I guess, orchestrators in, in musical theater, other than yourself? In musical theater, top top composers? Well, well, there would be Sondheim. Uh, well, Maury Yeston. Well, anybody that I'm working with. Oh, Matt Sklar is my new favorite. Um <laughs> And Andrew Lippa. Uh, now, historically, there's, you know, Gershwin, except for Porgy and Bess, I don't find, I'm not into his songs because they're, they're great musical scores. They're just great songs that are in musicals. So um, I, I don't put him in terms of musicals with all the, again, the exception of Porgy and Bess. Um, I know I'm forgetting some other important. So like top three, like just classical composers. Just who, who... Oh, classical. Oh, uh, Richard Strauss, Sibelius, Ravel. Well, you mentioned Sibelius and that. that's, that's a name that's, it is very well known in the classical fear, but non-musicians might not know that person. So why is Sibelius great? Well, I find his music, uh, it's episodic. He doesn't find cut and dry endings. I, I like when when the it's there seems to be a drama that keeps churning on and and you get the satisfaction only at the end of very long stretches. And there's a lot of darkness, uh, just like uh, we were just talking about uh, how the the lighting in Scandinavia you get those periods of darkness and I, it really feels like it's in the music. I like dark music. Now, uh, I guess my final question now is what advice can you give to somebody who wants to get into musical theater as a, either a composer or an orchestrator? Stay away. <laughs> Don't do it. And then if they must, then, uh, okay, advice. Well, if somebody, if somebody gives you a referral or gives you a job, Make sure they know that you're you're grateful. That's one thing. Uh, but also, then here's here's as far as practical advice. If you're thinking of doing what I've been doing, before before they ask you, could you do an arrangement? Do your studies first. Uh, and uh, by by example, I mean that at the point that I got asked to write to orchestrate my first show, which was Panama Hattie, I was I was 24. And I had put in a lot of years and read a lot of scores, um, and I've seen I've seen just the opposite. I've seen someone that plays piano and maybe conducts a little because they can wave their hands and the orchestra seems to follow them, and they get the opportunity. Could you do a chart? And they say, Oh yeah, I'll kind of like go home and figure it out or do my best or, uh, you know, it's like I just think there's a lot of homework to do and and you know learn from the classics and. Uh, uh, I, I wish if I had if I had an hour, I would tell you some of the some guiding musical principles. But uh, I can't. We maybe on a different time. Go back to what I said before. Don't settle for a counterpoint that seems to be rubbing a little bit with the melody. Take your time and uh, and just figure out what's you know what's going to work perfectly. And um, at the, and sketch your ideas out early in the day before it's three in the morning and you get to the, the last big build and you haven't thought about what that's going to be because at that point you're tired and you need to pull out the stops then and make it, you, you got to hit a home run. Uh, if you don't hit a home run, you're just, they're just not going to call you the second time. Yeah. Fantastic advice. And from such a great artist, uh, Larry, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. You're really one of the top guys in the world. Can I ask you what, what projects are you working on for the rest of the year and next year? It so happens that I'm working on three, well, I have four projects lined up in, over the next few months with a couple of breaks in between. And 
three of them are reductions of pieces I've done before. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Dolly is going on the road, so I'm working on a, a revision of what we have on Broadway right now. And then The Prom, which had a great out-of-town tryout, uh, one of the most amazing new shows. Uh, it's it's This is going to be... This is going to take over Broadway. Uh, the prom is topical and it's entertaining and it's hilarious and it's awesome. deeply touching. It's relevant and um, it's 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 the title sounds like it's just on the surface, but God, wait till you hear it and and wait till you see what the story is. It's it's wonderful and and you'll feel like you're on you're flying on air at the end of it. Uh, the music from Matt Sklar um, is amazing. Uh, it's uh, Chad Beglin's, uh, uh, wait, uh, did I get that right? Yes, um, lyrics and, and Bob Martin, the book, uh, and the stars in it, there's Beth Level, there's Christopher Sieber and uh, Brooks Asmanskis, and uh, wait, what was, the, oh, and there's Caitlin, I forgot her last name, but Caitlin, she's gonna be a star soon, and also Angie Schwar, all amazing talents. And oh, I, I left out the choreographer director, Director, choreographer, Casey Nicola. It looks like there's a lot of buzz around it, so it's, it seems really exciting. And my friend Dory Berenstein, producer with uh, Bill. Uh, oh, Bill, well, you know your last name. I don't have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Larry, It's it's been such a pleasure. You, you've been so, you, you, you're such a great guest. Oh, please. The pleasure is mine. Well, you know, it let me tell you something. I, if you ever, if it's too cold ever in New York, and if you want to come down to the to sunny Singapore, you have a standing invitation. You and your family. It's if you want to go to like a tropical paradise and have a good time, just come over here. We'll take care of you and just show you the sights, and you know, you can get away from the winter. Better watch out because I just might do that. That sounds fantastic. You know, there's a drink here called the Singapore Sling, yeah. which I don't even know what's in it, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure that. I'm sure that the real deal is much better. Let's let's stay in touch. I'd love to interview again because there's so much more. You have had such a huge career and there's so many more shows I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, but let's leave it here and have a great evening. And it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Larry. Well, I'm very flattered. I mean, you you by far overrate me. And and it's it's really been a pleasure talking to you. Your questions were great. You're a great interviewer. Wow. Oh, I'm going gonna, gonna to keep I'm that in. <laughs> You're terrific. And I hope you someday larry take care hope it's soon take care bye thank you so much for listening to my interview with the great larry hawkman it was such a thrill to be able to talk to such an amazing musician and i hope you really enjoyed the interview as well please take a moment to subscribe rate and review the show on itunes it'll really help bring more attention to the show and we can't wait for you to listen to our next guest thank you again and i'll see you at the next show